In this video, we'll be talking about working with Aperture Priority and Auto ISO. Welcome back to the channel everyone, this is Dylan Golby and welcome back to another Gear Short. In this week's video I'm going to be answering two viewer questions. Uh, the first is why I choose to work in Aperture Priority quite frequently and the other one is why I work with Auto ISO and how I work with Auto ISO. We'll discuss these two settings with regards to the X100V camera and that's not to say that these don't work with all other cameras but what it does is it gives us a way to sort of pigeonhole a specific way of working and say well these particular settings work for this and as with all settings on cameras there's no right or wrong answers there's just how you like to work how you get to the end result once that photograph is printed on paper it really doesn't matter whether it was made in aperture priority shutter priority manual mode or however else you could have shot jpeg or raw it really doesn't matter once that finished uh, image is done what does matter is why we choose the settings that we do and when we choose to just let the camera take control of certain aspects so that we can focus on others. So let's discuss it from that standpoint today. So why work in aperture priority mode at all? When you have manual mode that you can have full control and get perfectly repeatable results every single time. Well, the answer to that is that you really don't need to do that all of the time and while it's useful and we'll discuss some cases for that soon, being able to just let the camera drive a little bit, you take control of your creative aspects, say the aperture, your depth of field, and then let the camera take control of the shutter speed when it's unnecessary for you to really be thinking about that, just frees you up to just basically focus on the photography instead of considering all of the settings at all times. So for example, if you're working at say f2.8 in bright daylight, your shutter speed is likely to be quite high, somewhere around the 1,000th or 2,000th of a second. And at that point, there's not too many creative things that you can actually do with your shutter speed unless you're trying to, you know, freeze a hummingbird's wings or something like that. A thousandth of a second versus a two thousandth of a second when, say, somebody is walking through your frame really isn't going to make much of a difference. So you can let the camera drive at that point. However, what is really important in bright light is still controlling your depth of field, knowing when you want to have sharpness all the way through the frame and knowing when you want to have some blur. So for example, in this simple shot of a butterfly, I'm not really concerned about my shutter speed. It's in bright sunlight and I'm going to be shooting at around f2.8 to f4, depending on how much I would like to get in focus. But really what I'm after here is being able to blur that background and separate the butterfly from it. And so I don't really need to be in control of my shutter speed at that point because I know it's going to be fast enough. Again, with this backlit photo of a leaf, my shutter speed is at 1 1,300th of a second. If it was at 1 1,000th of a second or 1 1,500th of a second, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. No camera shake is going to be in there, there's no wind blowing, so it doesn't matter that I have to try and freeze this leaf. What does matter here is the depth of field, the composition, and all I have to do to change the exposure here is ride the exposure compensation dial until I'm happy with what I see in the viewfinder, and then I can start making pictures. Of course, as you change your framing in aperture priority, the camera is going to see different darker and lighter areas and the exposure might change slightly. But when I'm working in aperture priority, I'm typically walking around the streets making pictures, or maybe I'm sitting down having a cup of coffee with my wife and I make a quick portrait of her or a quick shot of our cup of coffee or something like that. I'm not going to be making dozens of photos that all need to have exactly the same exposure. So it doesn't matter that they slightly change. For example, in this image from last week's video, while I made several exposures to get the footfall and the subject position I was after, in this case it doesn't matter if the exposure is slightly different from frame to frame since I'm shooting raw and I'm going to process them anyway. And since I'm only going to be using one frame, it really doesn't matter. You're never going to see four or five of them together and say, ooh, you know, he, he slightly missed the exposure on that one. This one's a little bit darker than that one. I'll be able to control that in the RAW file and then present the one photo that I'm happy with, even if it was a third of a stop under or overexposed while I was actually out in the field. What was important was that I got the moment. 
Working in Aperture Priority, of course there are going to be times when maybe the light gets a little bit too dim or maybe you stop down your aperture too far and your shutter speed just gets that little bit too slow to hand hold or maybe you can hand hold it but the subject that you're uh, photographing is moving really quickly and so you'll get a little bit of blur. The one way that you can still sort of automatically counteract this is by using Auto ISO and basically this is just handing yet another setting off to the camera and if we're honest about things, ISO is probably the least creative element of the exposure triangle and it's the one we really shouldn't need to think about most of the time. When it comes to auto ISO settings on the X100, since I'm typically using this uh, in daylight for street photography or for just general sort of documenting my life, what I like to do is make sure that if I just pull it out of my bag and flip my aperture to what I want, I should get a sharp image in most light. And so what I've done is I've set my default sensitivity, my base ISO, the lowest it can go is 160, and then my max sensitivity up to 6400 because I really don't mind if there's a little bit of noise in my images. These cameras are, are pretty good. I mean, if you guys ever used, you know, film or early digital cameras, you'll know that ISO 400 was kind of gross back then. And now we can get pretty clean images at ISO 6400, even on a small sensor camera like this. So I don't really mind if it bothers you, maybe set it a little bit lower, but for me, I don't really mind. And then what I have is my minimum shutter speed set to 1 3 20th. And what that means is that if I'm pulling the camera up and I still haven't quite steadied it, I'll still get a reasonably sharp image no matter the circumstances. Now, of course, if you pull it up, hold and brace yourself, you could go down to a 60th or a 30th of a second for your minimum shutter speed, provided your subject's not moving. But for me, I like to know that, you know, pretty much no matter what subject I'm shooting or how I'm positioning myself or how sort of stable I am, I'm gonna get a pretty sharp image. And so that's pretty much the only setting that I have on this camera. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. I don't really set up three different auto ISO settings because you can override most of that anyway. As a first example, here's a night image from a trip to Tokyo. Here, the shutter speed was 1 250th and the ISO was 6400. And what that means is basically the camera has hit my ISO limit of 6400 and said, well, I can't go any further. So it's lowered the shutter speed to 1 250th of a second. Now, I don't mind the grain here. I would much rather have a photograph than not have a photograph. Uh, so the grain doesn't really bother me. Now, had I had a little more time to make this photo, I might have gone down to a 60th of a second, seeing as nothing was moving too quickly. And I could have got this shot at, say, ISO 1600 and had a bit of a cleaner file. But had I done that, I would have missed the moment. And again, I'd much rather have the moment than have missed the moment and have a slightly cleaner, lesser moment. So that brings me to the point of how to override these settings. Now, if you have auto ISO turned on and your minimum shutter speed is a 320th like mine, but you wanna shoot maybe some people moving in a scene and you want to blur them at say a 15th of a second. Well, what you can do is grab your, and this works on most camera systems, I believe all camera systems, you can grab your shutter speed dial and just turn it all the way around to a 15th. And now you've told the camera, use a 15th I don't care what the original minimal, uh, minimum shutter speed in this auto ISO was, I want you to use this shutter speed. And it will begin to do that. Then you can start making pictures and it will blur everything. Now, of course, you know, uh, at ISO, your base ISO, like 160 in broad daylight, a 15th of a second might be a little bit difficult to get. And so you may need an ND filter or to really stop down your aperture, but you can override that minimum shutter speed and that happens in both directions as well. So for example, for me, I'll often be working at say a family session and we'll decide to grab a child and throw them in the air. Now they're moving quite quickly at that point and my regular 250th or 320th of a second may not freeze them in place. And what I really wanna get is that beautiful expression uh, as they're flying through the air. And so what I might do is just quickly dial this around to a thousandth of a second, knowing that that is going to freeze them in the air and the camera will adjust my ISO uh, relative to that. And so it's one less setting that I have to do. So I can sort of say, okay, mom and dad, and be turning this as I do it to the correct shutter speed. Let's go one, two, three, and know that my shutter speed and my ISO and my aperture are all set before, without even having to look at this camera and before that child even gets into the air. So it's just a really quick way of working when you don't need those perfectly repeatable results. Here's an example from Shinjuku Station in Tokyo of a time when I did just take the shutter speed down to a 15th of a second and let the camera do its thing. And 
all I really wanted to do as I was sort of picking people out through this crowd was to then maybe pick one or two people and start panning with them. And if I move the camera at a 15th of a second, I can follow one person, keep them sharp or relatively sharp and blur all the other people as they're moving. So I decided I wanted to do that. I quickly flicked to a 15th of a second, made a few of those, went back to uh, automatic on the shutter speed and kept making the other pictures that I was making. A final good example of when the combination of auto ISO and aperture priority uh, is useful is on something like a rainy day. You know, you've got one hand to hold your camera with, maybe it's strapped to your wrist and you've got another hand holding an umbrella and you're walking around the street making some pictures. Now, rather than risk uh, dropping your umbrella, covering your camera, nice expensive camera, in rain and possibly getting a bit of water damage, or maybe even dropping your camera while trying to change too many settings, you can basically set your aperture to what you think it might need and let the camera drive. So if you walk into an alley and it's a little bit darker, you'll be able to get still a bright shot. If you're walking out into the, the brighter areas again, you'll get an exposure change, but your camera will deal with that. And so it's a very quick and easy way to work when the conditions aren't quite uh, favorable for basically being able to completely control your camera. So when it comes to casual off the cuff photography, Aperture priority and auto ISO are really, really useful settings to just make the process a little bit more enjoyable. But there are times when manual, full manual on any camera makes sense. And for me, those times are particularly when I'm going to be needing uh, repeatable results. So something like a commercial shoot where we may need to stitch different pieces of uh, an image together, or maybe I'm working with flash and I want to be able to control that ratio of ambient and flashlight, or maybe I'm working with really, really thick filters. Uh, so very, very dense filters that the camera has trouble seeing through and automatically exposing for. Or maybe I'm just exceeding the, say the Fujifilm cameras have a limit of 30 seconds in aperture priority. So maybe I'm exceeding that and doing a, you know, a two minute or a four minute or an eight minute exposure using a, a very dense filter. So I need to override and work in manual in those cases. In this first example, I'm not only making a panorama, which means each and every frame needs to have the same exposure so that it will accurately stitch in Photoshop, but I'm also using flash. So when I'm working with flash, I like to be able to set my ambient exposure and then add flash to that so that I know that the ratio is going to look good. And if you're working in manual, uh, if you're working in aperture priority, sorry, the camera might see something dark move in the background, change the exposure, and all of a sudden, you know, your ratio is off. And that will also affect the panorama in the end as well. So this is a really good case where I like to work with full manual mode. Here's another example using the X100. I'll often take my little graduated filters with me just so that I can darken down the sky as I walk around. Now, if you're in aperture priority, the camera is going to see this dark object sliding into the frame and try to correct for it. And each time you move that, it will correct and it will correct again. And it can be a little bit difficult to see uh, the exposure that you're going to get. So the way that I like to do this is to get a base exposure for the things that I don't need to darken and then drag the filter in until it begins to darken the areas uh, that I need darkened. In manual mode, that's really easy to do. Another filter that doesn't play nice with the meters is a very dark filter, like a 17 stop. The meter just doesn't get enough light to make a good reading and it goes all haywire. It might tell you you only need five seconds when you have something like a 17 stop filter in front. And typically you're going to need eight, 15 or 30 minutes even in daylight with a filter that dense. The other thing with that, of course, again, is that Fuji cameras have a limit of 30 seconds in aperture priority. So you are gonna need to go into full manual in order to set the exposure for that filter. So those are typically the times when I will switch into full manual mode. When I need predictable, repeatable results, when I'm working with flash, or when I need to go beyond the limits of what aperture priority or auto ISO will offer me. However, auto ISO and aperture priority allow you to basically hand things off to the camera and make the process of photography a little bit more enjoyable. At least that's the way that I see it. And then being able to override the shutter speed, but still have the auto ISO kick back in and correct your exposures for you is also really useful and opens up a whole lot more possibilities without really having to switch in and be changing so many settings all the time and potentially missing moments. As always, I hope this has been a helpful video for you. If you have any questions about auto ISO or aperture priority, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, thanks again for watching and please do like and subscribe. We'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.